Sounds great. I'd love to meet that guy. Yeah, thank you. Um, so before I start on my paper, I um, just uh, wanted to touch on a couple of things that have come up over, over the uh, discussion today. And, uh, particularly this issue of critical thinking, creative thinking, imagination seems to be a theme. Um, so I just wanted to throw in my two cents worth. It strikes me that, that creative thinking um, and imagination are, are actually not that different to good critical thinking because all of those things involve putting pressure, or discovering and putting pressure on, on hidden assumptions. Um, and so good critical thinking does that as well. The other thing to say is something you won't hear um, thrown around a lot by universities, um, but the, uh, the evidence is we, we have this kind of assumption that if you want to become a critical thinker, you go to university, and as you do all these subjects that you do, you become a good critical thinker. Well, several studies in the US uh, have shown that over a four-year period of an undergraduate degree, um, there's very, very little improvement in critical thinking. I don't think that's just a US problem. I think it's a, it's a general problem. Um, and uh, in fact, what improvement there is is probably about the same as kind of natural maturation. So what that tells you is that critical thinking is not something that we can we, we just absorb over time. Um, critical thinking is something that you have to actually learn to do. Uh, sadly, a lot of critical thinking courses are not particularly good. They, they're equivalent to um, talking about critical thinking, um, which I often think the analogy is something like trying to teach a people to play soccer by putting them in a room and showing them lots of soccer matches. Um, well, that's not how you learn to, to play soccer. You, you, by, you learn by doing. A good critical thinking course is based in doing, and there, there are some approaches, <coughs> excuse me, particularly one that is particularly effective. Um, anyway, that, that's my little rant about critical thinking. You can come back to that later, but I'm talking about this today, um, the lure of strike, um, and it's, I'm wandering into dangerous territory. I'm not an Air Force guy, um, so feel free to shut me down later. The, the title um, for my presentation, The Lure of Strike, uh, is pinched from this guy, Con Crane. Um, some of you may know of him. He, he was the lead author of the uh, counterinsurgency manual under the Petraeus era. Um, I saw him earlier this year, um, and he used that phrase again. But he, he's probably most well known these days for this particular quote, so I thought I'd see how well known it is here. There are two approaches to war. Can anyone finish it? Nice. Asymmetric and stupid. See, I knew it would be. Yeah. All right. So he's kind of famous for these little catchphrases. But the uh, the lure of strike is another one he's become quite well known for. Um, and he first used it in this uh, special commentary in the, uh, the uh, journal Parameters, which is the journal of the U.S. Army War College. Um, and this is the the abstract. An increasingly important part of the new American way of war has been a reliance on standoff technology to project power. The lure is minimal friendly casualties and short, inexpensive wars with only limited land power commitments. Unfortunately, inflated expectations for such an outcome have often led to A, strategic overreach, and B, a dangerously unbalanced force, force structure. So that's his kind of essential argument. I'm going to go in a slightly different direction with that, that idea. Um, but I thought I'd point out that, uh, which I hadn't realized until I looked this up earlier. Uh, a couple of months ago when I started to work on this, that in the same episode of Parameters there was a, a response by, by this guy, uh, not the taller one, uh, Charlie Dunlap, uh, who is a former um, US Air Force Deputy JAG, he was Deputy JAG for the US Air Force, but he was visiting us earlier this year as well. Um, and uh, clearly this article got under Charlie's skin, and he wrote a response, it wasn't the best thing he ever wrote, um, but basically he was fuming, right? So he said, here we have a distinguished historian becoming, in a sense, an inter-service hitman and chief spokesperson for the Army's small but burgeoning neo-Luddite wing. <laughs> I'm, I only raise that because I'm kind of hoping I don't get quite the same response today. <laughs> right. Um, all right, so, so the, the first question I want to ask is, does this apply to the ADF and particularly the RAF? Uh, is this something that we have fallen prone to? Uh, do we, are we leaning towards a reliance on standoff technology to project power with a promise of reduced friendly casualties and short, tidy wars with limited land power commitments? Yeah, I'm an outsider in all of this, but it looks, looks like certainly something we need to be, be aware of and be thinking about. Now, there are those implications uh, that Con Crane pointed to. Uh, I won't go in that direction because that's not my particular area of expertise, 
But I think that there's something overlooked here, and that's the ethics side of this. Particularly the point is this, that air power-centric tidy wars are just not that tidy on the ground. Right? They're tidy from our perspective. We're the ones that uh, are sitting back from a distance. Um, but for those on the ground, it's pretty messy. And this brings us to the rather awkward problem of level <coughs> damage. And I teach uh, the, the uh, military ethics course here. Um, and so, of course, we, we talk about this. We talk about the, the, the principle of the, or the doctrine of double effect. But the idea is simply that um, under, under certain conditions, you can knowingly cause death to non-combatants as long as that's not your intention, it's proportional, and so on. But I always have students who come to me afterwards and go, yeah, OK, but really, what is the difference between knowingly but unintentionally killing non-combatants and knowingly killing non-combatants? It's pretty much the same for the non-combatants. That's a pretty tough one to answer. Um, we, we could spend ages talking about the doctrine of double effect, and, and I, I'm not saying we should throw it out. But it's a pretty awkward and difficult uh, issue. So that's by way of, of kind of drawing out this issue of the connection between ethics and strategy. And I think the picture traditionally is something like this. Strategy is the main thing, but it's bounded by a kind of fence of ethics. Right? So what we can and can't do, well, there's that kind of circle. Uh, within that, we do strategy, but the, uh, our, our range of action is somewhat constrained by ethical principles. That's what ethics is there to do, it's to draw lines for us. That's the sort of traditional view. There are those who are frustrated by the role of ethics and, and law in, in contemporary conflicts who would see it as maybe looking something more like this, right? There's not a lot of room for strategy and a heck of a lot of banging on about ethics around, around the fringes. <coughs> maybe that's true, I don't know, but we'll see. But I think um, Clausewitz would certainly be one of those people who, who really doesn't like this pushing of ethics into, into the, the discussion. Uh, there's also quite a good quote from on war. Um, in such dangerous things as war, the error, errors which proceed from a spirit of benevolence are the worst. As the use of physical power to the utmost extent by no means excludes the cooperation of the intelligence, it follows that he who uses force unsparingly, without reference to the bloodshed involved, must obtain a superiority if his adversary uses less vigor in its application. So Clausewitz wasn't wild about ethics. I mean, it's always difficult to know exactly what he meant on war, but um, he certainly wouldn't be pleased by that picture. Um, I, and I, I should confess, I'm, I'm taking a lot of what, what I'm, the thrust of what I'm, I'm doing here from um, a book that's coming out next year, I think. Um, it's called Beyond Clausewitz, Ethics and Military Strategy in the 21st Century. Uh, I had the opportunity to read a little bit of it. Um, and it's by uh, George Lucas. Oh, sorry, wrong George Lucas. Uh, <coughs> George Lucas, who was uh, my colleague back at the, the U.S. Naval Academy. And so he's. It's a, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting book. Um, the bits that I've seen, and he makes this point. He says, "Look, Clausewitz philosophically is heavily influenced by Newton. Um, you see this in, in his in his writings that there's this kind of structured way of thinking, um, and it's all about Newtonian type things like force, right?" Uh, so this is George Lucas. On war is explicitly and self-consciously Newtonian, heavily reliant for metaphors drawn from classical dynamics. Militaries are compared to complex, highly organized machines serving as instruments of state that in conventional war are used to apply appropriate force, conceived as opposing vectors to presume centers of gravity in an effort to move these focal points of political inertia from a given position to an alternative one that the stronger adversary deems more favorable to its own political interests. Right, so if you've ever read any Klaus Witz, and yeah, there, there are other, other strategists out there that we listen to, but really it often does boil over to Klaus Witz, doesn't it? Um, that, that resonates, right? That there's this kind of uh, classical Newtonian conception going on. But the reality is many of the wars that we are fighting are what we could perhaps call non-Newtonian. Uh, and that's been, uh, there have been various thinkers who have tried to express this in different ways. Um, so you've got Mary Keldor, the New Wars thesis. You've got Hoffman and Co. talking about hybrid wars. Van Creveld, non-Trinitarian war, and so on and so on. Sure, degenerate war. We could kind of, whatever you think of each of those different attempts to try and 
encapsulate what's going on. They're all trying to say something that, like, look, this traditional view that we've, we've been u using, this kind of Newtonian approach that we've, or, or framework that we've been trying to apply to war, doesn't fit anymore. What we're doing is something different. We call it non-Newtonian. And Lucas's argument, and I think it's a, an interesting one and one with uh, consideration, is that we've moved into an era where ethics is not about a, a boundary around <coughs> the scope of strategy, but rather ethics has become the very heart of strategy. Right? Ethics is the first thing, and that, should, that is the driver of strategy rather than the other way around. So that's what he's contending for. So it's a pretty uh, outrageous contention, but perhaps worthwhile. And, and interestingly, I kind of had roughly that same um, intuition some years ago when I, when I wrote this paper and another one with the colleague uh, back in South Africa, um, where, I, where I said, look, traditional just war theory is about these, these borders and, and trying to kind of put, put rings around things and, and limit action. What we need is something that drives action. Uh, and, and there, we, in these papers, we, we drew on uh, what's called the capabilities approach. It's, a, it's an approach to ethics that comes out of development theory, right? ideas of, of human development. Um, I don't think the papers are particularly good. I'm not suggesting you're going to, going to read them. But, it, but I think George Lucas and I are, are kind of on the same wavelength, that what we're looking at is a, is a different conceptualization of the role of ethics. And one way of, it strikes me of, of thinking about what's changed and how that change has happened is that in traditional Newtonian type wars we have legitimacy which is closely tied to, to the way we view ethics is in effect top down right so you've got this kind of big picture that's driving what's acceptable in what goes on beneath so why, why, were, why was it ever okay for us to bomb cities well because we had a big picture of legitimacy Legitimacy had a big capital L, and so anything beneath that that we did was kind of justifiable because we had capital L legitimacy, right? Um, as, as Andrew said, <coughs> I used to teach at the US Naval Academy, and I would of every, every year present them with the, the question of whether, uh, you know, the justifiability of dropping atomic bombs on Japan. Because by any of the, the principles that we, we study in, in military ethics, it looks like possibly the, the worst single war crime in history. Um, but no one ever accepts that, right? Because we have this idea of legitimacy with a capital L, and so we can, what happens beneath that is acceptable, it's justified. Uh, and so Curtis LeMay, I thought it was quite a useful way of encapsulizing that. If we maintain our faith in God, love of freedom, and superior global air power, the future looks good, right? But it, it's very top-down, isn't it? We have God and freedom on our side, uh, and that justifies everything else. I think in non-Newtonian war, things look different. Uh, my wife, every now and then, will say, so explain to me again what's happening in Syria. <laughs> I don't know. I don't understand it. And I think that's part of the problem. We don't have a capital L legitimacy story going on there. We don't have the bad guys, and, and it's clear who they are, and it's clear how we should attack them. Um, it's just not that kind of a war, right? Um, so legitimacy looks much more like this. Are we, are, is what we're doing legitimate? Well, are we helping the children? That's kind of the question. It's bottom up. It's these kinds of pictures. Uh, are we illegitimate? Well, are we hurting the children? Right? It's that kind of narrative that's driving how we think about uh, whether what we're doing is legitimate or not. So I think that there may be some implications for air power, and this is a little bit of kind of wild speculation on my part, from someone who doesn't knows nothing about air power, so please for, forgive this. Um, but I do think we need to at least ask the question of what does air power mean? Power to do what? Okay, that's a key question. Um, and maybe, at least to, we should think about setting aside that default Newtonian perspective, starting with force. Maybe that's not the start. So is this air power? Right? Could air power mean having the ability to have little drones that go into places like Syria that record everything so that later on we can arrest people or broadcast what's going on to the supporters of ISIS or something like that? Right? Maybe that's not force, but maybe that's power. Is this air power? The ability to help rather than blow things up 
I'm all for blowing things up, that's great. But maybe this is also air power. Right? Maybe this is more powerful in some circumstances. Uh, this little drone is uh, a jury-rigged attempt to, to match a, um, a taser to, to a little drone. So maybe, maybe air power is not lethal power. I don't know. I don't even know what those are. So I don't know why I put that slide in. But anyway, it could be something else, something that I can't even think of. Well, the point is, our assumption is that air power is fundamentally about exerting force. We need to perhaps step back from that and go, what is it really? What is power? The power to do what? Um, and of course, this is still the air power. So sometimes F-35 is the answer. Um, but still, there are other aspects, and perhaps we need to, to think about what, what that would look like. So having run crazily into a, landmine, a, land, a minefield uh, deliberately, um, I'll pause and try to deflect your questions. So, over to you. Questions, comments, and complaints. I can talk really loud if that's all right. Um, This goes back, I just want to ask something that goes back to sort of the age old question in the Nuremberg defence insofar as when we talk about ethical application of air power, what role is it for the airmen to actually question that? Uh, for example, the pilots that are doing the strikes in Syria, what is it their responsibility to question the intelligence, to question the information they have? And what responsibility then rests with the, the government who's legitimately directing it? Yeah, really good question. I mean, so the, the easy answer is um, your you have a responsibility to ignore illegal orders. But the question is, if it's a legal order, but you think it's unethical, what do you do? And I, and I don't think there are neat, easy answers to that. But I think uh, um, you know, one of the points that's come out through the discussion today is, is the importance of having, of having an environment where people can raise those kinds of things and actually discuss it, and where they are taken seriously. Um, I think we have to think carefully. Of, we have to be prepared to deal with those kinds of issues because of um, not so much PTSD, but moral injury, for example. Um, so, yeah, there, there's, I don't think there's a neat answer, but, uh, but I suspect that we need to think a lot harder about that, about uh, freedom of conscience um, and what we do under those circumstances, um, because it, I think it's important. So, plus, obviously, you've got, got the issue of effectiveness, people who are then pushed into doing things they feel are wrong, uh, that, that's always going to be a problem down the line. I was at a conference recently, we were talking about weaponising moral injury, which is to say that we have certain moral standards that apply in our strategy, and it may be that we are lured in to do things that we think in any other circumstance would be morally wrong, or we're prevented from doing because we think they're morally wrong, that we might then do for strategic reasons, and therefore we produce a whole lot of people who are disabled by the fact that their moral compass may have been damaged or disorientated by being obliged, goaded into doing things that they don't like, such as killing children. In other words, that we know that you people don't like doing that. We don't have any qualms about it, but you don't like it, and therefore using children. So it's not that just the child gets killed, but the person who does it and is debilitated. So this is another whole area that we've been looking at here at the Academy. No question here. Human shields, very topical use of human shields. Um, my question um, about ROE, rules of engagement, and whether you'd got to the point of taking your argument and thinking through what ROE might look like if you saw them as enablers. At the, at the moment, the ROE its concept is it's a constraint. So it sits within that Newtonian paradigm. So we have force, but then ROE will define the, the limits, the constraints within which we'll do that. But yours, you're turning that around. So have you, an idea, have you thought about what ROE might look like if you, we had a different Fine. paradigm? I, look, I'm not suggesting we don't need constraints. So, so I'm, I'm, I don't think we would necessarily throw out ROE. We, we still need to have some clear, bright lines that, that can't be crossed. I think my, my point is more that that can't be where, where we stop with ethics. And I think that's, that's the tendency is to go, okay, look, uh, you know, here's, here's, uh, here's our problem, uh, here's the ethical constraints we, that are around it, now go, go and solve it. Instead of going, look, what's the fundamental driver for what we're doing here? And that's got to be about ethics in some sense, or, or about, you know, human rights, perhaps, something like that. But, and we do that. 
but I don't think we do it as deliberately and connect it as closely to strategy as it's perhaps useful. So yeah, I, it, does, it sort of dodges your question. I, I think we still need ROE, but, but I suppose part of it comes back to not ROE, but commander's intent. So if we have a, have a much clearer sense of, look, what's the, the moral driver of what we're doing, that will help when you're making those decisions. Shoot, no shoot sometimes, right? Well, actually, I know that we're, we're about taking more risk on ourselves than putting it on to local civilians, something like that, um, whatever that may be. Um, I uh, wondered what your thoughts were on an um, argument I heard uh, put forward recently talking about collateral damage, um, and it suggested that the, um, uh, the appetite for um, collateral damage should hinge on um, an assessment of um, political culpability. So what, what the individual meant was, let's just say you had a state who um, it was perpetuating you know, some sort of genocidal um, uh, act of war, but they were democratically elected. Um, this person argued, therefore, that your appetite for collateral damage should be greater because these people shared some sort of, um, uh, you know, element of participation by voting these people in as distinct from a dictator who is doing the same thing. So, um, someone else made pretty much that argument, a guy called Osama bin Laden, um, and it, it basically he was saying, look, um, we, we did nothing wrong in, attack, in attacking the, the towers because they were Americans, they paid their taxes, they voted for these people who are, who are attacking us, and so they're legitimate targets. Um, my response is, for that very reason, I think we need to be a bit careful. Uh, and look, so, so in, the, in the kind of debate, the scholarly debate around uh, ethics of armed conflict at the moment, there's, there's, a, there's a big sector that's kind of saying, you know, we, we buy all these just war theory constraints that, that have been traditional, discrimination, proportionality, all that stuff. What we don't buy is that any war actually meets them. Um, that actually if we apply these constraints strictly, all wars off, off the table. So it's a, it's a view called contingent pacifism. And I've been thinking about what I think about that. And I think the problem is, is it mis misunderstands the nature of just war theory. It thinks that these principles that we have are principled, but they're not. Um, I think they're a, they're, a, they're a purely compromise solution that there are compromise between, on the one hand, we accept that wars are going to happen. Uh, we're not going to be pacifists in, in practice. Um, but we think there should be some kinds of constraints. Uh, we don't want wars to go everywhere. So this is the compromise we've come up with. I don't think there are necessarily, you know, we can make the kind of sharp philosophical lines that um, some of my colleagues in, in, in academia would like to do. Um, so it's a pragmatic thing. It's a, the point of, of these constraints is to limit unnecessary death and destruction. So that's where I think we've got to be careful about moving those kinds of boundaries. Um, the moment we start to do that, we open a door and we make war worse than, than it needs to be, perhaps. While the microphone's going, what do you make of drone operators suffering PTSD? Um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting one. I think it's pro it probably happens. I, I haven't seen the stats on that, but... Um, they're sorry, they're high. They suffer more PTSD than Right. And I wonder if that's PTSD, and, and you know, we've, we've had this discussion, is that really PTSD? So is it about traumatic stress? Or is it, again, something more ethical, moral? Is it some kind of moral injury going on where there's a, there's a sense of, I'm involved in something and I just don't feel right about it? I, I, well, I'm, I'm that close to what I'm doing. There's a kind of moral jarring going on and that's where that suffering comes in. Um, and, and it may be tied to, there seems to be a kind of human view that I've got to put myself out there for this to be legitimate. Uh, the number of times I've, I've fielded comments from people who are saying, look, well, the problem with drone warfare is we've got no skin in the game, so it's sort of unfair. Well, war is not supposed to be fair, right? And it doesn't um, have to, you don't have to put yourself at risk for it for what you do to be just. But there is something innately human about that response, um, that I've got to put myself at risk if I'm going to harm someone else. So maybe that's where, where that's coming in. Because it's not heroic. It's right. not courageous. Yeah. There's no bravery being shown. It's just arcade game type killing, isn't right. it? Right, really? and I can't say it was him or me, which gives you a justification. Uh, so. no, it isn't just that. It's also, they're also involved in 
BB-8 wasn't Dr. Bob doing the assessment straight after. Right. So having put in the strike, the drone, then, if it's still in, in, in field, goes back and looks at body parts to identify what, who was killed, who wasn't killed, and what the result of the actual strike was. Right. Now, that, most pilots don't do that. Right. And, and the long loiter time as well with the drones, so ahead of the strike, that you've, you form some sort of sense of these targets as human beings. And that could happen four or five times in one issue. Right. And then you go home and cook dinner for the wife and kids. But then you can watch a movie where the same thing happens when your brain says, I'm not complicit. Uh, you can do it. Yeah. You're not checking the body parts you just caused. Yeah. Although you may see the body parts in what's to C2 images. I caused that, I didn't cause that. That's real, yeah. that's Hollywood. Um, question up here, Peter. Thanks, yeah, Peter Hopkins, <coughs> Sydney Uni. It it's looked to me like your interest in sort of localised small L legitimacy might actually be suggesting a variant of air power that actually converges with policing. Is that something that you have contemplated? I mean, certainly we see the militarisation of police forces. I'm wondering whether there's a sort of convergence around security. Oh, look, I think that, that absolutely, and, and in a way, um, you know, a lot of the, the challenges we face is because of the blurring of these boundaries. Um, th there's a, a, a book by a guy called Philip Bobbitt, if you've come across it, um, called The Shield of Achilles, and he makes the point that, that effectively strategy is the flip side of law enforcement, in other words, or, or, or constitutional order. Um, there, there are two sides of the same coin, but we're much more comfortable with the law, the law side of that. Um, and I think the, the, the challenge with a lot of um, contemporary operations is that they sit right on that border, or the border isn't really there. What is this thing that we're doing? Are we going after bad guys in the sense of criminals, or are we fighting the enemy? Uh, traditionally, we've sort of respected the enemy to some degree. It depends on the enemy. Um, so, so yes, I, I think um, that certainly legitimacy, law enforcement has a lot more legitimacy than blowing things up uh, in, in our our world today. Whereas with that, you know, the Nazis are the bad guys, well, we didn't really worry about bombing the crap out of their cities because they were the bad guys. Uh, whereas the, the messy environment now does push towards more of a law enforcement kind of paradigm. So is non-Newtonian war actually war? Does it, does it matter if we put a title on it? Maybe not, maybe not. But um, it's where we're fighting. So whether it's war or not, that's where, where our militaries are operating. Um, so e either we, we replace our, our camo people with police or we, we take it on in some way and, and try to understand what it is. I'm just thinking from the, the whole the just war theory, the legitimacy. Yep proportionality, etc., etc. I'll come back to the comment you made about, you know, drone things, is it heroic, is it not heroic? One of the most interesting comments I heard while I was in theatre in 2008 was from a two-star who was working in the CAOC. And uh, he went out, flew a B-1 mission, sat up above Afghanistan for a few hours, came back, was very disappointed he didn't get to kill anyone. And he made the comment, I can't believe these cowards won't come out and fight us like men. <laughs> Think about how heroic it is to just be dropping ordnance from that high and that statement. And to me it just seemed that he was completely oblivious to the environment he was in. But that said, when I asked him what his strategy was within the chaos, he said this is an insurgency, there is no strategy, we wait for them to stick their heads up and we kill them. I might have that strategy. is why they will not win that war. <laughs> <laughs> it's not necessarily well, a good strategy. Well, I mean, the other, the other, I think, notable <coughs> thing is, is if a police, police officer killed someone, at least in this country, invariably, there will be an inquiry, and at some point, someone will say that action was justified or it wasn't justified. You acted within the law and your powers, or you didn't. That, Unless what I saw on today's ABC News website actually produces proceedings to get a conviction for the ADF, that, that almost never happens. So people have to make their own judgment to some degree as to whether what they did was justified and within their own set of parameters for, for being a human being. Whereas the police, I would suggest, um, have someone else do that for them, to give them that clarification that what you did was lawful, uh, what you did was justified. I think most police forces are investigated by uh, police forces or um, 
associated uh, people, um, and there is just as much independence in investigations in ADF or Defence Force uh, activities as there are in police force activities. So to say that uh, because the ADF does it, or that somebody looks at an ADF action, um, is not totally independent, and it's not uh, totally transparent to the public, um, that it's wrong, I think is a false premise. No, no, all I'm simply saying is that in the majority of cases, <coughs> there isn't that, even if it's done by police looking at police, uh, and you might say, well, all of those inquiries suffer from the fact that they're internal jobs. All I'm simply saying is that in, in one instance it exists, and for the majority of other instances, it doesn't. That, that, that was all. You don't, you don't see that? You don't? Uh, I, I uh, totally disagree. Disagree with I, what? I have not seen... Yep. Somebody calls a death somewhere in the defence force that hasn't raised uh, an eyebrow that wasn't investigated properly. So, um, um, so if, yeah. if for I mean, if it's an there unlawful were a number of investigations yeah. um, on operations in Afghanistan, uh, quite a number of investigations. There are a number of investigations done on operations in Timor. There are a number of investigations done on operations uh, in Iraq. Just because you haven't heard about them doesn't mean that they haven't happened and haven't been thorough and fully investigated. Uh, so I think you're talking past each other. I think you're talking about ones where there's uh, suspicion of some wrongdoing. And what you're saying is if you kill someone and there is no suspicion of wrongdoing, nobody investigates it because it was completely... Right. Yeah, that's, that's all the distinction I'm drawing. Not Sorry, I, if I didn't make myself clear. That's the distinction I was drawing. I mean, it comes back to this, this question, you know, is what we're doing war? Because the, the classic um, rules of war, in a sense, draw a circle around a time and place and say, look, within the boundaries of this, we're going to do something that's kind of odd for human beings. We're going to say, it's sort of okay for us to kill each other. Right? We're not going to hold anybody responsible afterwards. No one's going to be tried for it and put in jail. We're just going to kill each other until somebody wins. Um, but that requires neat, sharp boundaries to, to work. The problem is when we're fighting the kinds of wars we're in now, these kind of non-Newtonian wars, those, that doesn't really apply. Um, and so it gets really difficult. There's a whole debate or um, literature emerging on what's called grey zone conflicts. Um, yeah, we haven't really figured that out. <coughs> Last one. This is an area that I've looked up too. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going to pass it back. Sorry, because no one will go there. Fact, can I just go there and then I'll finish up with you? Yeah, so Nathan Kloss from One Squadron. i just got a couple of comments I'd like to make. I think the distinction between the police force and, and the uh, military use of force there is the police force will be investigated after the fact to ensure that their actions are in accordance with their guidance, yep. whereas when uh, we go ahead and do a strike overseas, that rig has gone ahead before the fact to ensure it's in accordance with the nation's interest um, before the go-ahead is given for the strike. So in most cases, that investigation, that rigour is carried out beforehand. Um, Do you think the two are equal? Um, <clears throat> or comparable? I think that uh, when we talk about the police force, mo more often than not, um, it is something out of self defence, uh, whereas uh, the military will use um, or can use offensive force. Um, and, and that's where that, um, that rigour needs to go in beforehand to make sure that it is in accordance with the nation's interests. Uh, the point that we were talking about with the, with the drones uh, and uh, PTSD associated with drones, I'd just like to make the point that um, I think it is more about the persistence that drones have uh, watching um, a potential target. Uh, we're talking weeks here and to the point where the people who are watching that screen uh, literally are that intimately involved with that person that you know their mannerisms and you, even though you've never spoken to that person before, um, you start to get an appreciation of what their personality is like and that's where the problem is with drones, vice, um, fast air. Um, the, the point about ethics I'd like to discuss with you is um, we have a lot of stringent ROE and a, a lot of structure behind the use of uh, force, as in kinetic force, um, and so the ethics behind that is what we've been discussing. But what I'd like to ask you about is the ethics of reporting. So where the, uh, I guess, the culpability of the action that happens doesn't necessarily fall on the person who is reporting the information, 
Uh, and what I'm talking about here is kind of um, situational awareness that we were speaking about before, is where you have enough people where you can dissolve the responsibility to someone else. Um, in these days where we don't want to make mistakes, we have a lot more people getting involved in the targeting process and I believe it's getting to the point where we can dissolve the responsibility to someone else. Um, and we've taken the decision making ability away from the people uh, in the aircraft mm -hmm. who are the ones who are employing the ordinance. Um, so how do we ensure that we have ethical reporting, yeah. for want of a better term? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So it, it, it's, a, it's a, a kind of well-known problem in ethics generally is when you have multiple mm -hmm. agents involved, the, you have this diffusion of responsibility and it's difficult to say you're responsible for that. Um, so on one hand, that, that's problematic. On the other hand, obviously it is a good thing to have multiple levels of, of review and, and assessment if the system is working pro properly and it comes back to the organisation. Uh, is the organisation working as it ought to? Um, and I guess... I mean, part of the, 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 the issue here is, is thinking about the nature, the nature of the responsibility involved. Because um, when we're often, you know, sometimes it could be a kind of criminal negligence, but in more zones, we're not usually talking about that kind of responsibility. But still, there's a kind of responsibility to make sure that you're doing uh, you know, as little unnecessary harm as possible. This is something that's really difficult to, to evaluate. What does that mean exactly in every situation? But it doesn't mean the responsibility isn't there. So I guess one of, one of the issues is, the nature, the kind of responsibility is different. Um, so in answer, yes, I, look, I think it is a good thing that we have multiple checks. Um, I don't think we, we want a situation where we're putting people in a position where if something goes wrong, you're it because of the, the kind of complexity of these kinds of environments. I think that's, that's, that would be unfair. But nonetheless, we do want to recognize responsibility. I if that helps. Yeah, complexity is the, the theme I want to ask about too, because that's also one of the lists of definitions of warfare, complex warfare. And what makes warfare often modern, Afghan is a good example, complex is that it's really not necessarily, it's not just it's not clear who the enemy is, it's also more, and this is the ethical dimension, that it's your actions that create the enemy. So they're not necessarily an enemy until you do something and then they become the enemy. and in modern warfare, that even includes situations where people are shooting at you. And just because they're shooting at you, and sure you have a right of self-defense, but just because they're shooting at you, it's not actually clear that they are your enemy. Now, that, from a Newtonian Clausewitz perspective, it sounds insane, I mean, that's just crazy. But where I take this from is actually the British experience in Helmand, and there's a very good book by British Army, so Army officer Mike Mountain about this. And the argument essentially is that the British created an insurgency through stomping around, including airstrikes, at an inappropriate time. So part of that makes decision making extremely difficult, but it makes ethical decision making even more difficult. Because yes, they become insurgents, but they only became insurgents because you started it by dropping bombs at inappropriate times. See where I'm going? Yeah. So this becomes very, very difficult. I doubt you have a solution, but this is where the complexity com comes yeah. in. And in part, it's this kind of, it's, it's almost going back to this concept of enemy, right? That, that's almost where the problem lies. You, you don't have the same problem with law enforcement. Um, obviously, the context is very different. And, and maybe if they overstep the bounds, perhaps. But, but it, it goes back to a, a kind of Newtonian view of there, there are these kind of counterweights. There's them and us, and that's what we're, we're, we're dealing with. Well, it's not necessarily the case. Right? Yeah. But it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right, exactly. So we're, we're imposing this construct on the, on the environment and so making it. Thank you all for the discussion and particularly thank you to Tim.